Hi students, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the public land survey system today and why you should try to learn how it works. Um, it's very common to have questions about this on introductory kinds of jobs, either in planning or in um, natural resource management because the public land survey system um, basically laid out land ownership in the U.S., most of the U.S., definitely this part of the U.S. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history and a little bit about how the um, system works to locate things within it, pieces of land within it. Um, and then you can go take a little quiz and see if you got the main points. So if you're doing field work, if you're going out someplace to check some endangered species or something, you might um, encounter the public land survey system um, in terms of dealing with who owns what piece of, of property. Um, the system was set, set up by Thomas Jefferson. Um, he was laying out settlement for much of the US and he set up this system to try to improve the way that um, property was allocated to different settlers to reduce um, the amount of conflict over little pieces of land and to have a uniform way to um, describe um, pieces of property and who owned what, right? So this system was designed to be easy and um, something that anybody could understand. Um, okay, so um, this happened in 1785 uh, where he put this together by the Land Ordinance Act, okay. Um, in the field, um, they awarded contractors to surveyors who then bought, or er, bought, who then um, hired teams to come with them and they used these long chains and um, these measurement tools that measured angles to um, actually survey, like physically go out, walk the land, measure the distances, measure the angles, and um, and divide it into these grid squares of property that individual settlers could own, right? Prior to this, Native Americans didn't own land in that way, right? Um, so, in order to do this, they wrote down things in what are called plat books sometimes, plat maps. Um, they had notes in their surveying map. And then, um, so you can see on the right hand side here, we've got some notes about which township and range they're surveying and then details about what, you know, what each section was like. And then for this same area, you can see the the note map that they made and then over there to the left is the official uh, plat map that they made from that those notes okay so oftentimes you will hear about plat maps or plat books um, also any map that has to do with land ownership which is what we're talking about here um, it can also be called a cadastral map okay so you might hear those terms cadastral map plat map plat book. These were used to um, give land to um, individual settler families. Okay, here's some other examples of these types of maps. They would print out a book for each county which would have who owned which piece of properties um, and if there was land still available for settlement. Um, okay, so here's how it was laid out. For each area, like on this map, you can see that there is a um, what's called a principal meridian and then a baseline. Okay, so for each area they were surveying, there would be a north-south line, which was called a principal meridian, and an east-west line, which was called a baseline. Okay, and so then the the square, the grid squares, the townships and ranges would be counted um, north or south of the baselines and east or west of the principal meridians. Okay, 
Got that? So here's an example. Um, we can see a baseline um, in the middle of Arkansas, sort of. So um, northern part of Arkansas would have township numbers that were going north from that baseline. Southern part would go south from that baseline. And then it says fifth, fifth principal meridian. Um, so the, the far eastern, sort of northeastern corner of Arkansas would then have um, eastern uh, ranges and the rest would have western ranges. Okay, so a township and range, um, or what's often called a township, is a six mile by six mile square. And um, in this drawing here, you can see that um, we start at the initial point and then you count one, two, three, four west or east. Um, and then you count, you know, one, two, three, four north or south. So each grid square has a designation either north or south and either east or west. Okay. Um, within each township, it's divided into 36 sections and each section is one mile square. Okay, so, so now we're looking at one township square, so six miles by six miles, divided up into 36 little sections. Okay, and they're numbered in this weird way, starting at the northeast corner with section one and going um, west. Like the, the surveyors were walking west, then they would go south and then back east again. So this is sometimes called as the ox plows, okay? So strange numbering system. So each of these little 36 little squares is called a section, okay? Um, so each section is one mile square. Um, usually in most places they set aside section 16 to be a school and section 36 to be um, for government operations and that kind of things. Um, all of this facilitated the Homesteading Act. So in 1862, they, the Congress passed this Homesteading Act, which basically said any um, citizen of the U.S. could file for a quarter section of free land. So, um, so not a whole mile square, but a quarter mile by quarter mile quarter section. And then you had to like build a house and dig a well and, you know, plow some land and fence some areas and live there. And then you got that land for free, having stolen it from the Native Americans. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about section subdivisions. It's very um, weird the way they did this, but um, it makes sense once you kind of get the hang of it. So these are sometimes called aliquot parts. So within one little section, um, you could divide it up into four quarters, right? You'd have a northwest quarter, a northeast quarter, a southwest quarter, and a southeast quarter, okay? So, so that's the first division. Um, then you could divide each of those quarters further into halves or quarters, okay? Um, and this is written in a way that starts with the smallest subdivision and then as you move right, as you're writing, goes to the largest subdivision. So for me, sometimes I like to read them backwards, okay? So like um, square A, labeled with that big red A, is the southwest quarter of this section and it's the western half of that southwest quarter okay but you write it um, western half southwest quarter um, same thing with the area labeled B okay so if I was gonna say it I would tend to say it okay so this is the southeast quarter 
of this section and within that it's the um, southeast quarter and within that quarter it's the northwest quarter. Very confusing because you write it sort of backwards to the way that you would normally think about it. Um, I, I would think. Okay, when you're writing out these um, section subdivisions, you don't write in the, a comma, okay? All of this is all um, one thing. You can see on the drawing on the um, le bottom left here that a comma means a different thing than when it's written without a comma. Good to know, right? Okay, so now we're going to try practicing this real quick. So um, maybe pause the video here for a second and try writing out what are the aliquot parts of this section. Okay, so part A, so the square labeled A, the square labeled B, and the square labeled C. Okay, when you are ready, you can unpause and I will reveal the correct answers. Okay, here you go. Um, square A is the northwest quarter. Square B is the southeast quarter. And it, within that, it's the northwest quarter, right? And square C is the southwest quarter and then the southeast quarter within that and the northeast quarter within that. Okay. Um, if you were going to write all three of these and indicate all three of them together, you would write it like this um, so that you had a comma between each um, square that you were indicating. Um, so that's the basics of how the public land survey system works. Um, please go to Canvas and try out our little quiz. See if you can correctly identify things um, within this system. Um, this system is still totally in evidence on our landscape today okay so in rural areas it's really common for roads and fence lines to follow section or quarter section boundaries and it's common to find monuments um, marking sections or quarter sections so um, if you're doing any field work out in rural areas um, you might need to know this or if you're looking into the history of land use or if you're involved in planning, you might need to know these things. All right. Thanks very much, guys.